echo. Yep. It's a Christmas echo. Well, there was this man by the name of Fred. And Fred on Christmas Day broke his arm. And he broke his arm as he was trying to use his son's brand new skateboard. Fred decided that he would file a claim with his insurance company. Several days later, Fred received this letter back from his insurance company. It read, in part, your claim has been denied because stupidity is a pre-existing condition. <laughs> I don't think Fred's the only one with that problem. But that's a whole other message. Isn't it? Well, this morning, I want to continue our study in the book of Revelation, and we are going to look at the second half of the Christmas story which is found in Revelation in chapter 12. If you missed the first part of that message, you can get it back there after the service, or believe it or not, you can go to our website now, if you haven't done that, and you'll find that all the messages are right there. Uh, you can just go to the website, click sermon, and you see all the sermons are listed there. Well, this morning, I have entitled the message, The Rest of the Story. Father, I thank you so much. It's an awesome time of the year. I know some people don't always feel it's so awesome. It can bring up so many different emotions in our lives. It can bring up loneliness for some of us because we miss loved ones, and I do ask for great grace and blessing upon all those who have lost someone. And they're sensing that hole in their life. Only you ultimately, I know, Lord, can and heal the wounded heart. And so I just ask for your blessing and grace to be upon those that right now are sad because of the loss of the Lord. But Lord, this is a time of great joy. You've drawn us here this morning to sing about that joy. Most incredible miracle of all, God coming, God breaking into this existence, this world. And I just pray, as we look at the Christmas message through Revelation chapter 12, you will really give us, Lord, ears to hear and soft hearts to receive. Because it's life-changing if we truly receive the Christmas message. And so I pray that for each and every person here, that truly they won't just hear it, but they'll receive it. And they will truly walk out of here different than when they came in. So I ask that you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. And I just ask that you be glorified in these next minutes. And I ask for this in your precious name. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive
good news this morning. Christmas is first and foremost about good news. Revelation chapter 12 is about good news. You know what the good news is? The good news is that God broke into this world 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. The good news is that none of us has to live in fear. No one has to fear death. No one has to fear anything because Jesus Christ ultimately conquered. You do not have to live in fear. That is good news. Hallelujah. It is also good news that none of us have to live a defeated life. You do not have to live in defeat. Jesus, the good news is, gives us the power to overcome. You may have an addiction this morning you cannot break. You may have a stronghold. But the good news is, is that Jesus has overcome. That is ultimately the message of Christmas. That God and the person of Jesus Christ came to planet Earth. And he has and he will defeat Satan and evil. Now we see the rest of the Christmas story. So if you have your Bibles, look with me at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, and we see the rest of the story. She, that is the nation of Israel, in the person of Mary, gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Now, you know, we kind of like the first part of that verse there. She gave birth to a son 2,000 years ago. In the backwater town of Bethlehem, Mary gave birth to a baby boy. Skip, can you put that picture up? Now, who doesn't like a baby, huh? Who doesn't find a baby cute? Who's not attracted to a baby? Harry Reasoner. I don't know, Skip, do you have Harry's picture? I don't remember. Harry Reasoner, some of you might be familiar with his name, but he was a commentator and a reporter with the famed CBS uh, program, 60 Minutes. And many years ago, he gave a commentary at Christmas time. He entitled it The Remarkable Power of Christianity. Here is part of that commentary he read. The appearance of the Lord of the universe in the form of a helpless babe is a startling idea. It has magnificent appeal. Almost nobody has seen God, and almost nobody has any real idea of what he is like. The truth is that among the men, among men, the idea of seeing God suddenly and standing in a very bright light is not necessarily a completely comforting and appealing idea. But everyone has seen babies, and most people like them. If God wanted to be loved as well as feared, he moved correctly. If he wanted to know his people as well as rule them, he moved correctly. And if God wanted to be intimately a part of man, he moved correctly. For the experience of birth and familyhood is one of our most intimate and precious experiences. So it comes beyond logic. It is either all falsehood or it is the truest thing in the world. God in the person of man has such a dramatic shock towards the human heart that if it is not true, then nothing is true. So spoke Harry Reasoner on 60 Minutes. Now what I find interesting, though, about the Christmas story, according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, is this. Here's the three parts of the Christmas story according to Revelation 12.5. You have a baby born. 
We all like that part. We all understand that part. But the next thing we're told is that he is ascended to the throne. And that's the ascension of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we're told that this baby who grows into man, who ascended into the throne, who is the God, man, is going to come back one day and he's going to rule with an iron scepter. Now, what seems to be missing there? We would say the guts of the story is missing. In fact, we would say the guts of the story is Jesus' life here on planet Earth. And we find that in Philippians in chapter 2. And so if you have your Bibles, look with me at Philippians chapter 2. And this is the part that's missing in Revelation chapter 12, 5. It says this, though he, Jesus, was God. So we understand from Paul, and this is one of the earliest Christian uh, pieces of scripture, it's a hymn, actually, and by the way, about two years after Jesus' death, this is what the early church was confessing. It says, though he, Jesus, was God, he did not think equality with God. That is, Jesus is, in fact, equal with God. He did not think it's something to cling to, something to hold on to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He gave up his divine rights. How? He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You know, we love that part of the story. We love the part of the story where we find out that God and the person of Jesus Christ came and he died for us. We love the idea that God sacrificed for us. That part we find very appealing. We find very attractive. You know, not too long ago, actually this past week, I read a story about a teenager who really didn't like to be with her mother in public. Nothing too unusual about that. And one day they went to a mall together and they were shopping together. And at this one particular point, they bought something, they went up to the cash register, and the mother reached out her hand to pay the sales clerk. And when the sales clerk saw the mother's hand, he re, you know, went backwards, his, his eyes flicked whore as he saw the mother's hands, because you see, the mother's hands were horribly disfigured. When they got home, the daughter immediately went up to her bedroom. She was embarrassed. She was angry. The mother waited about an hour or so, and then she went up to the daughter's bedroom, and for the first time, she explained to her daughter the real story behind the scarred hands. The mother said this, when you were a baby, I woke up to a burning house. Your room was an inferno, flames were everywhere. I could have gotten out the front door, but I decided I'd rather die with you than leave you to die alone. I ran through the fire, picked you up, wrapped my arms around you, and then I went through the flames, and my arms and my hands caught fire. When I got outside the, on the lawn, the pain was absolutely agonizing, but when I looked down and I looked at you, all I could do was rejoice that the fire had not touched you. The daughter was stunned, and she saw her mother completely through different eyes. In those scarred hands, they became beautiful to her. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he sent me. He sent himself. That's what Jesus was saying. Do you realize that it was God who died on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ? And he said, For I loved you so much that I died for you. And then he said, whoever believes in me, whoever will receive my gift of love, whoever will receive my gift of forgiveness by repenting of their sin and wrongdoing, you shall not perish, but Amen. you shall have everlasting life. And we respond to that. We respond to a God who loves us. And we rightfully so should. But I want you to understand when you read the book of Revelation, when you read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, there is so much more to the Christmas story. And yes, it is true that God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you. And God desires to have an eternal relationship with each person here and each person out there. But, you know, 
what is not understood. What most people simply do not understand, and tragically it really is no longer hardly taught in the pulpits in America, is that God seeks to change you. Amen. God seeks to change you, and God seeks to change you, and God seeks to change me. In fact, I want you to know something. If you do receive Jesus Christ, if you really surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you experience that incredible grace and mercy and love that he offered, he demands that you change. Now, this is actually quite shocking. You know, I, I, I've been a pastor for some 30 years and I've done a fair amount of premarital counseling. And uh, in, in, in sessions, most of the time, the young couple, usually it's a young couple, they're facing me. But every once in a while, I will have the couple actually face each other. And at one point, I will ask him in the counseling sessions, I'll say, now look at the person right across from you. I mean, I want you to really look at them. Can you honestly say that you love that person in front of you? Or do you love the person you believe you can change them into being? No, big difference. Do you love the person in front of you? Or do you love the person you believe you can change them into being. Now, I don't want to appear sexist here, but so often it's the woman who thinks that she's going to change the man. No, this is really true. She, she thinks somehow that she's going to domesticate and tame the man in front of her. If you're thinking that, that is a recipe for disaster. In fact, I, no, I will say, I will say this, I will say to the couple, I said, look, if you don't love the person in front of you, just the way they are right now, and if they never change, then do yourself and do them a favor. Do not get married. Do not get married, or it's going to be an absolutely, it's going to be an absolute disaster. Now here is really the interesting thing. Do you realize that one of the major metaphors in the Bible is respect to Jesus Christ and the church? Do you know what that major metaphor is? Right. Marriage. Jesus is the groom. If you're a believer, we are the bride. And guess what? Jesus expects us to change. Jesus expects a pure bride. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. You see, the truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ expects us to change and to be just like him. Now, if we're honest, if we're really honest, we generally think when it comes to our relationships, and we really expect in our marriage, we generally think our marriage, our relationships would be so much better if the person would be just like us and just do what we want to do. Wouldn't your marriage be better if your spouse would just be like you and do whatever you want? No, I mean, I mean, I, I can see the transparency problem here. <laughs> but no, it's, it's it, really, the, the, the reality of the matter is, see, the big problem they have is most of us think we're normal. No, we think we're normal, and the real truth of the matter is we're all a little weird. And the only thing we need to haggle about is how weird we are. No, it's true. See, the real, no, get this now. The real benchmark, the real benchmark of normalcy. Do you know who the real benchmark of normalcy is? Jesus. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not like Jesus. And I, they're tipping their hand. I said, well, why not? Said, no, see, that's what we're aiming for. I'm not normal. You probably already knew that. You're not normal. Jesus is normal, and Jesus expects us to change and to be like him. And I'll tell you, one of the great verses in all of the Bible, actually one of the two great verses in all of the Bible is this. We know Romans 8, 20, for God causes, for God causes some things. For God causes all things to work together for the good. Now watch this. For those who love him and for those who are called according to the purpose. His purposes. Which means for those who are obedient to him. 
Do you realize what a powerful verse that is? That means that there's nothing, if you're a believer, there's nothing that happens in your life that God doesn't allow. And if he allows it, it's going to be good, and there's a purpose behind it. Can you imagine being a per person of the world who doesn't know Jesus? I mean, life, something happens to him. A car accident happens to him. Cancer happens to him. Life happens, ladies and gentlemen. Life is going to happen to you. And if you don't know Christ, then it's, it's complete without purpose. Probably the most devastating thing about suffering and trials and tribulations for people in the world is it seems pointless. But save that for the believer. For God causes all things in your life, all things, not something, all things to work together for the good. Good's going to come out of it. It's going to be perfect. I mean, that is a tremendous verse of hope for the believer. But now watch what it says in, in, in verse 29. Skip, can you put that up? It says this, for God knew his people in advance. You know that Greek word know or know or new means? It means intimately. Do you realize that God knows you? No. God knows you. And it says that he not only knows you, it says it in the sense of loving you. He's talking now about believers. So it says God knew you. His people in advance. He knew you in eternity past. Now watch this. And he chose you. Some of us think that we're unlovable. And in many ways we are. But even though we were unlovable, it said that God chose you. You're not an accident. It's not by accident you came to Christ. If you're in Christ, if you're a believer, it's not by accident. Do you realize it says, this is what Scripture said. It says that in eternity past, God loved you. And he chose you. And he chose you. And he chose you. And now watch what it said. And he chose them to become like Frank. <laughs> And he chose them to become like my spouse. No, it says he chose us to become like Jesus. He chose us to look like Jesus. God expects us to change and to be like Jesus, plain and simple. Earlier I read to you Philippians chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8. Now watch this. Here's Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. Skip, can you put that up? Therefore, God elevated him, that's Jesus, to the, so God the Father elevates Jesus to the highest place of honor, and he gave him, Jesus, a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee should bow and will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This matches up with Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, it says that when Jesus Christ comes back, he will rule with an iron scepter. He will rule with an iron rod. This confuses a lot of people because they're not quite understanding. This doesn't seem like the loving Jesus, but it is a loving Jesus because what these verses are trying to tell each one of us is that when Jesus Christ comes back, all people... Believer, unbeliever, all angels, good angels, evil, evil angels, everything, everything in this universe will ultimately surrender and conform to Jesus' way. And it's going to either be willingly or unwillingly. And you say, well, why is it? I'll tell you why it is. Because Jesus is perfect. No, the Christmas story is not just about a baby. Yes, it's about a baby. The baby grows up to be the God-man. He is perfect in all his ways, and you can improve upon perfection. And that's why ultimately everything must be conformed to him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is what the Christmas story is about. Not just the baby, but it's about the baby growing up and being the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he will rule. Ultimately, and you will conform to him. You will surrender to him, either willingly or unwillingly. W.C. Fields. Skip, can you put up this picture? Many of you are probably familiar with W.C. Fields. He's an older guy. He was a great comedian, comic, in years gone by. Made a lot of people laugh. But you know what's interesting about W.C. Fields? He wasn't a happy man himself. 
In fact, he drank heavily from the bottle. He was an alcoholic. And here's the interesting part of the story of W.C. Fields. Most people don't know this part of the story. W.C. Fields spent, spent the last three to four years of his life in Los in Cena sanator Sanatorium. That is absolutely true. And he was dying of cirrhosis of the liver there at the young age of 66 years old. The last couple of weeks of his life, he was bedridden. And he read basically just one book. Does anybody know what that book was? The Bible. W.C. Fields never read the Bible in his lifetime. But the last two weeks of his life, he was reading the Bible and was amazed. One of his friends came in and it was absolutely astounded when he saw W.C. Fields going through the Bible. And the friend said, W.C., what are you doing? And he said, just looking for loopholes. Just looking for loopholes. Because only W.C. Fields could. Revelation 12, 5 tells us there are no loopholes. There are absolutely no loopholes. Everything, everything, whether you like it or not, this is what Revelation is about. This is what the Christmas story is about. Everything ultimately will surrender and be conformed to Jesus Christ because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I just want to give us a challenge now. Here's the challenge. The challenge is this. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, we see that Jesus first starts out as a baby. And that's a great part of the Christmas story. And that's the part of the story that most of us celebrate. I mean, people get excited, like I said. We just love little babies. But Revelation 12, 5 says, really, the real Christmas story is that it's about God coming to this planet. Do you realize that God, one day, is going to come back to the planet in the person of Jesus Christ? And he is going to rule. He is going to rule. As with an iron scepter. He is going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's going to be his way or the highway. So here are the two options you have. Because this is really what Christmas is about. Christmas is about me, Frank Gray, you. In the end, it's an individual decision. I'm either going to make the choice to willingly surrender myself to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to make the decision that I'm going to dedicate whatever life I have left. I'm going to completely and totally dedicate it to him. And then I'm going to let him from this point forward be my king and be my Lord. Yes, he saved me. But Christmas is much more than just about Jesus coming and saving you. It's about him being Lord. And you miss the story if you don't understand that he is Lord. And the reason why so many of us are defeated and we live in fear is because he's not Lord. But the moment you step over the line and you say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I dedicate my life to you. I am going to further your cause, your way, your kingdom Victory in life breaks into your life. And you, no, no, you will begin to experience Christmas. I guarantee that. But there's a second option. You can say no. You can say no. I am not, I, I, I like the little baby part, but I'm not going for this king of kings and this lord of lords stuff. He's not going to be my king. But let me tell you something. You will ultimately surrender. This is what Revelation is about. Jesus wins, and you will ultimately surrender your life to his will and to his ways, but it will be, sadly, unwillingly in a place called hell. Amen. Now, you know what really excited me that put Mike Brod up? I'll tell you what excited me about Mike Brod. Because this is a guy, and you were hearing his story. You know, you know, there, there were parts of the story of Jesus he liked. Yeah, he could solve my emptiness. He can do this. He can do that. But you can notice he wasn't surrendering really to Christ. And what is so exciting, I mean, I remember Susan telling me about this guy, Mike Brod. And she said, this, this guy gave us, I mean, and she could see it in him. She, I mean, there are times you can tell, you know, we, we've been at the game a long time. And you can tell when someone's just mouthing, oh, yeah, I got I, I to get that big thing right Nothing happens. You know, you, you know nothing's going to happen. She goes, but no, it's different. She says, I could see the Holy Spirit on that guy. He got saved. He got really 
saved. Now, I was skeptical because Susan's had a lot of pseudo conversions. <laughs> it's true, true. I said, I said, we'll see, we'll see. I'm going to tell you, it is absolutely astounding. No, it is absolutely astounding to see what happens when a person truly surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. That's a change, man. It is so exciting to see what the Holy Spirit has been doing in that man and through that man. And the lives that are being touched. This man is advancing the kingdom. And that's what the Christmas story is about. The Christmas story is really about receiving that baby Jesus and making him Lord. And he will change your life. And he'll give you purpose and meaning in your life. That is really what Christmas is about. And my prayer is that you really do experience Christmas. If you perhaps for the first time in a real way. This is your opportunity this morning. If you had not, to truly, I mean truly, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for what took place this morning. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are moving. I know you're moving in the hearts of people right now. And you want to do business. Jesus, you said in Revelation chapter 3, to the church at Laodicea, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I will come in. And I will fellowship with you. Can you imagine fellowshipping with the God of the universe? And allowing him to take control of your life. If there's anyone who hasn't done that this morning, that's my prayer. That this morning would be that morning. Now have your ways. We sing this last song. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.